Good morning, AUSA. Welcome to Warrior's Corner, day one. Our first presenter's topic is by soldiers for soldiers, building an organic soldier-led software development capability in the Army. Presenters include Lieutenant Colonel Vito Errico, Director of Army Software Factory, Army Futures Command, First Lieutenant Raquel David, Ma Military Project Product Manager, First Lieutenant Amand Shah, Military Application Engineer, and Staff Sergeant Chris Pauley, Military Platform Engineer. Hey, good morning, everybody. Everybody hear me okay? All right. First of all, thank you for joining us for the inaugural War Warriors Corner presentation. Uh, it's an absolute honor to appear to be representing General Murray and Sergeant Major Crosby and all of the Army Futures Command team. Some of you might be wondering what the Army Software Factory is, and we're here to talk about that. Um, as we do that, I would ask you to think about and consider two questions as we talk about everything that the Software Factory um, potentially provides the Army. The first one, how to industrial age uh, organizations upskill and reskill their talent to dominate in an information age? The second question, how does the Army prepare its soldiers for a future operating environment that's going to ask commanders to make better and faster decisions among an increasing amount of data streams and information flows? That's what we think the software factory does. It answers those two questions. Let's go to the first slide. Some of you may be wondering where did this come from? Uh, it comes from, like the secretary talked about during her keynote, an incredible amount of analysis, uh, not by the Army or not by Futures Command, um, but by multiple bipartisan, nonpartisan groups from across the federal government. Integrating software engineers and data scientists to the leading edge should not be a controversial issue in 2021. How about the next slide? What does it mean for the Army? Well like we kind of talked about, as commanders face an increasing amount of data streams to make decisions at the Nipper, Sipper, JWIX, and commercial internet levels, somebody's got to be at that last tactical mile to make sense of all that information. We're not so sure we're going to be able to move contractors around the battlefields in the same way that we were able to do so in Iraq and Afghanistan. And we certainly think in the age, in the information age, it's time to start investing in soldiers who have these skill sets already. Let's go to the next slide. Ultimately, the Army Software Factory, nested with the Chief Information Officer of the Army and the Enterprise Cloud Management Agency of the Ar underneath the CIO, is about how do you produce an autonomous application or product team that's capable of prototyping, developing, and getting a solution on an operational network at the edge of the battlefield that we can't prepare them to do now. We don't know what commanders might need them to do. So we've got we've to essentially plan for ambiguity and plan for unpredictability. And by investing in this competence for soldiers now, we can begin to invest in the future. At the end of the day, we all kind of see one-off solutions that get built across the Army. But what the software factory is about doing is building an enduring and scalable capability for soldiers across the Army. Again, well nested with HQDA, with the Chief Information Officer of the Army, and with the Enterprise Cloud Management Agency. Let's go to the next one. So what's so special about upskilling and reskilling a workforce for the information age, and how do we do it? Well, we had this idea that there's probably a lot of software development talent in the Army that the Army didn't realize it has. This morning, the Secretary talked a little bit about the, the race for talent. We're a big part of that. We thought, let's start doing some soldier interviews and seeing how many soldiers across the Army would be interested in agile DevSecOps, agile software development, platform engineering, all these sort of not so emerging technologies that Silicon Valley and private industry have sort of figured out that the Army needs to begin investing in in a big way. And you might not be surprised to, to realize that we, after about 3,000 soldier touch points, we discovered a completely untapped market of soldier talent. And it was abundantly clear to Army leadership at that point that uh, the Army had an opportunity here to put that talent to work. And uh, we've got some of them that are going to be talking a little bit later after I'm done. But you could imagine where should the Army be investing some talent when it comes time to 
the choice of truck driver or software developer, combat medic or platform engineer. We've got such amazing talent in the Army that can be reskilled, that's mislabeled, that's uh, underutilized, that we can put towards emerging technology skill sets. So what we do is uh, we've been getting about uh, 250 to 350 fully qualified applications every six months. Uh, we assemble a cohort of soldiers uh, and put them towards lines of effort like product management, user design, um, application engineering, platform engineering, and we, and we baseline their skill sets. We, we choose about uh, 25 of them to be a part of five application teams uh, in a sort of a, a paced biannual process. Once they get that technical accelerator, we bring them in and we pair them with Silicon Valley experts, not so that they can hone their own expertise, but they can begin to learn to how to work as a Silicon Valley product team, just like we might see in some of our favorite Silicon Valley companies. But really, it's the teamwork. It's learning how to prototype a solution that they weren't handed and prescribed the exact uh, answers ahead of time. It's again, it's that planning for ambiguity factor. At the same time, we're teaching them how to build for a production environment. And that gets back to our relationship with the, as we co-develop our platform with the Chief Information Officer and the Enterprise Cloud Management Agency. By teaching them how to build for production, we sort of underwrite a lot of the risk that we see going on uh, across industry and across the Army in how to uh, build a DevSecOps uh, capability that, that has yet to really be um, championed. And we're going to hear a little bit more about that afterwards. So the whole idea then, uh, now you've got about a year's worth of experience in a variety of different ways, is now you have these, these soldiers that can then in turn and, and turn around and train the soldiers that come after them. So again, every six months it gives us this cohort model that allows us to sort of like, like agile software development, to build, measure, and learn. That's the fundamental idea here, is how do we grow this in a self-sustaining way? Um, that's, that's sort of the, the special sauce there. And you get an idea for, for how, how much across the whole army that we're really pulling. Um, a variety of MOSs, a variety of ranks. We didn't really care, and this is key, we didn't really care what rank you were or where you went to grad school. Uh, in fact, we probably thought most of our soldiers didn't need to go to grad school to be able to code, uh, and, they and most of them have not. Uh, so we have soldiers everywhere from the rank of uh, private first class all the way up to major. And the idea is to put rank aside and promote ideas. Because uh, you could imagine just as much as what a private first class can learn from a captain, you could imagine what that captain can learn from that private first class. And that's the fundamental idea, as, as we consider how the Army should invest and institutionalize expertise in emerging technologies. Let's go to the next one. The third part of the software factory, right, we have the human, the talent management component, we've got the technology component, but we've also got the component of it that sort of forges relationships with uh, non-traditional industry, with the tech industry, uh, with the traditional defense industry, uh, and that's a big part of what we're doing down in Austin. So every week we're hosting lunch and learns, we're hosting uh, talks from Microsoft, from Facebook, from Google, uh, and the soldiers are getting exposed to that sort of problem solving process that Silicon Valley has, has, has sort of championed. Um, and we're sort of leveraging the fact that uh, the software factory is in such a, a phenomenal location like Austin where right down the road are the headquarters of Google, Facebook, and Tesla. Right up the road is the UT Macomb School of Business. And then that leads us to national partnerships with a lot of the companies that are here today. Let's go to the next slide, please. What I would also kind of point out to everybody here today that's listening is that uh, we have a tendency to sort of plan things in a vacuum, and we build in a way that, uh, hey, everything is going to be great in the next two years. We didn't do that in this case. Uh, just like agile software development, we sort of we sort of learned as we went, and so we were building a, a proof of concept project as we developed this, the concept for the wider software factory project. And so this proof of concept project was built in conjunction with the chief information officer of the army. It was built in conjunction with the enterprise cloud management agency. It was built with soldiers at Fort Hood and Army Materiel Command. And what we quickly realized is everything about the software factory should be well nested with operational and Army-wide partners. And that's really a key to success. So uh, we just sent soldiers up to Fort Hood to observe what could happen uh, in uh, logistics warehouses across the Army. 
And the beautiful thing about the Army is those logistics warehouses are sort of all standardized. So if we could solve a problem for one logistics warehouse, we could solve a potentially solve a problem for all logistics warehouses. And by monitoring soldier behavior, and this gets us into a lot of the top line talking points of user-centered design, which is really soldier-centered design, and then the idea of the software factory is taking soldier-centered design one step further and, and co-developing with soldiers to make sure you're getting the projects right. Um, we found out that we could automate something that was inherently manual at the, at the warehouses using accredited DevSecOps pipelines and platforms, again, through co-development with the Army CIO. Um, we were able to fast track a solution to the field that hadn't been able to get out there uh, despite the fact that people had been requesting it. And as you can see there, the, the, big, the big number, it's about 3,500 soldier hours saved per, uh, per SSA across the Army, uh, is something that we're really proud of. And so we took all the lessons learned, the good things and the bad, and that informed the concept development of what became uh, the Army Software Factory. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. So uh, current status is uh, we've got cohort one. I talked a little bit about the cohort of soldiers that we bring on every six months. So cohort one is through their technical accelerator phase. They're through their discovery and framing phase, and they're already coding solutions to, to Army problems with partners across the Army. And these are some of the partners that, that we're doing. Um, cohort two, uh, they're finishing up their technical accelerator, and they'll be starting their, uh, their pairing phase uh, right after Thanksgiving. Cohort three will be here in December, and then uh, cohort four, pending HRC's approval, uh, they'll, be in, uh, they'll be in Austin next summer. So uh, without further ado, I want to let you hear from some of the soldiers. And as, as they come up and they talk to you about their projects, I want you to think about the fact that the Army did not sign them up to be software developers. They self-selected in because they had the aptitude and the attitude. And I think what we've proven out here is that uh, a little bit of organic capability will go a long way uh, towards informing a lot of policy that the Army creates over uh, the next couple years as we consider, like the Secretary said this morning, uh, dominating an information age. So, uh, Lieutenant Raquel David, why don't you come up and uh, introduce yourself to the crowd. Hello, everyone. I'm Lieutenant Raquel David, originally an uh, engineer officer, I guess I still am, and uh, I'm originally from New York, uh, and I'm a product manager on Team MobCop. Can you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. And so on the product manager on Team MobCop. As it stands today, National Guard and Reservists, uh, they, so 600,000 people who want to apply for and volunteer for active duty jobs, it is incredibly difficult for them to do that. And so me and my team, we partnered with the G357, the Chief of the Army Reserves, and uh, the National Guard Bureau, as well as other hiring managers across the Army to find out what are soldiers experiencing that makes this process so difficult. And what we found is that the existing tool, Tour of Duty, it's only accessible on Nipper, which means that most National Guard and Reservists can't access it. They need to go physically to the nearest uh, either post or armory or something that is able to, you, they can go on a government computer and go on Nipper to access Tour of Duty, which is incredibly difficult even to see what is even available. What we also found is that once they do find something that interests them, the process to actually get that job is incredibly manual. It, they need to physically pick up a phone or email someone in order to move their packet along, and this process takes a long time, and people often give up because it's so difficult. And what's, what we found most baffling is that the Army owns this data, they own the existing code, and so what me and my team are here to do is to overhaul Turo Duty and produce a solution that soldiers can use in the palm of their hand. Next slide, please. So our solution, Carrera, enables soldiers to view open positions from anywhere uh, on their, either their personal phone or their computer uh, in a secure way. They can uh, find jobs that they're eligible for, since not, they're not eligible for every single job, but find jobs that they're eligible for and jobs that they actually want to apply for. And by doing so, uh, what we hope to accomplish is getting uh, matching top soldier talent with top jobs in a way that's prompt and personalized so that we can better manage the talent that already exists in our force and so the Army is ready to mobilize. And I will hand it back to Colonel Erico to talk about the next project. So unfortunately, uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, thanks to Southwest Airlines, uh, the person that was going to brief this slide can't be here right now. Um, but uh, 
what we're doing is we're continuing the work from the proof of concept uh, with Army Materiel Command and uh, potentially looking at how soldiers engage in the preventative maintenance checks and services process, which as many of us I think that are listening here know is the lifeblood for how the Army maintains its equipment at the end user level. There's a lot that technology can provide um, in sort of a simple, scalable way that the soldier perspective will uniquely inform. And so uh, we have a team dedicated towards working with Army Materiel Command, working with units up at Fort Hood, Fort Riley, um, in understanding how soldiers are using the equipment and then what we could potentially meet them with halfway as the Army fields uh, larger systems. Um, let's go to the next slide and let's bring up uh, Lieutenant Anand Shah. So the motto of the software factory is by soldiers for soldiers. Last year, Sergeant Major Grinston asked us to build a digital tool that empowers squad leaders. The bluff of our project is that we've built an accredited army tool for soldiers' personal devices. Sergeant Major Grinston kept our charter vague. Like Lieutenant Colonel Erico said, we're planning for ambiguity. He simply requested that we ask what soldiers want and we build that. So that's what we did. Every week since the inception of our team, we've had touch points from soldiers and squad leaders from Fort Hood and Fort Lewis about what they need. We learned that a company of 150 soldiers oftentimes is assigned only 15 laptops. We learned that staff duty rosters will oftentimes get lost in a WhatsApp group chat. We also learned that a squad's day-to-day -day schedule isn't just affected by what's on a chalkboard at the platoon office, but also by last minute appointments and taskings. So some takeaways. Soldiers don't have consistent access to the existing army provided tools. So they use third party systems on their personal devices like WhatsApp and Google Drive. We hope to decrease this task and schedule volatility so squads can focus on readiness and cohesion. So based on their feedback, we set out to build a solution with them. Next slide, please. Soldiers guided us as we built a web app that allows soldiers to pool and assign tasks, manage unit events and personal appointments, and share their digital counseling packets. Right now, the lack of access to legit Army tools forces soldiers to conduct and coordinate Army businesses on unaccredited third-party applications which we can't control and which can go down at any time like we saw last week. Our app meets soldiers where they are, on their personal cell phones. And it's still a work in progress. We still gather feedback every week and we need more. So for members of the Army family, come find us at the Futures Command booth. We'll onboard you to the app and you can join the team that's building the My Squad app by soldiers for soldiers. Our app is built on an accredited Army platform, which is worked on by engineers such as Staff Sergeant Polly, who's going to come up next. Good afternoon. I'm Staff Sergeant Polly, and I'm the platform engineer for a software factory. Uh, formerly, I was a cybersecurity analyst at Fort Hood, and prior to that, I was satellite communications. And after 12 years of service, I would have never thought I would be here working DevSecOps ecosystem for a software factory for the Army. And our product that we built, next slide please, is a Sorcerer. And with this product, it's an accredited, secure, Kubernetes-based platform that hosts our Army applications, and we provide a path to production for these applications. The process to go from inception to authority to operate was typically around two years, and we reduced that time to three to six months with our product, Sorcerer. Traditionally, an app team without the Sorcerer product, they will own everything in the green on the left, which is the build process, the security controls, the infrastructure, networking. But with the Sorcerer product, we handle all that for them. We enable our application developers to focus on coding. This is possible through a variety of innovative tools such as Kubernetes and the use of automation. I've used this word two times now, Kubernetes. Not many people know what it is, 
It's a very new tool, less than four or five years old. If you, have any if you want to know more information about it, you can come to our booth at the Army Software Factory. Once the app team is in production, teams continuously integrate and deploy their code at such a rapid pace if they want to fix uh, bug fixes and features, quickly integrating changes into the production provides an incredible value enabling our developers to get software into the hands of uh, soldiers' hands faster. And that's it. Thank you. Thanks, that's our Burley. So uh, we're going to open it up to questions, and so start getting warmed up. Um, but before we do that, I want to just sort of close on, remember those two questions I, I opened with about how does the Army think about going from an industrial-aged workforce to an information-age workforce, and then how does the Army help commanders operate in a future environment of increasingly complicated uh, communication suites, weapons platforms, information streams, and data streams. So again, the software factory upskills, reskills soldiers who have the talent, who have the desire in modern application engineering and software development. We're institutionalizing those practices so that we're not just building this one time, we're opening it up for the Army to build, build more widely, and that's under consideration at HQDA right now. Um, we're leveraging modern technology through close partnership with the Army CIO and the DevSecOps ecosystem that the Army CIO is championing so that we can put technology to work for everyday soldiers so that we can actually build applications faster. And then lastly, uh, leveraging the unique location of Futures Command with respect to the, all the tech companies in Austin uh, with the modernization efforts down there at the headquarters as well as uh, Fort Hood just being right up the road. Uh, Sort of, uh, sort of a perfect storm for the Army Software Factory. So uh, really appreciate everybody's attention. It was v very much an honor to be able to go first for the Warriors Corner at this year's AUSA. And uh, welcome any and all questions anybody has. I think we have a mic in the back for anybody that wants to ask. Thank you very much. That was a fantastic presentation. You should be very, really proud of the, the, the progress that you've made. With the United States Army's Global Force Information Management System and Enterprise Business Systems Convergence both adopting and piloting low-code platforms, how do you see low-code platforms being integrated into the software factory? Thank you. You guys okay if I take this one? <laughs> okay. Uh, so I think you know, low-code is obviously uh, pretty, pretty popular right now. Um, some things to think about for low code is that there are a lot of discrete solutions out there. So for you know the Army as a customer's perspective, it's hard to pick just one, and I'm not a contracting officer. I'm not an acquisition officer. Um, I do think that the work being done by the DevSecOps um, ecosystem underneath the Chief Information of the Army, the platform work that Sergeant, uh, Staff Sergeant Pauly is doing, is providing the policy guidance and the security accreditation precedent so that as the Army fields those kinds of things, you know, cybersecurity is sort of a reciprocal, or there's a reciprocity associated with cybersecurity across the DOD, which you're obviously aware. Um, by us trailblazing a path uh, with the CIO of the Army, bringing on low-code solutions or proprietary solutions, we'll get through the FedRAMP process faster. It'll get through the DOD accreditation process faster. And so that's another great part that we didn't really mention is the faster we can bring on third-party applications, the more the Army will benefit from that as well. Great question. Thank you. Um, you uh, noted that the size of the cohorts right now are about 25 personnel. Is any thought being given to increase the size of those just to kind of increase the pipeline and the throughput of the folks you're training? Yeah, I, uh, great question. What I can say right now is uh, this is very much a, a, the software factory itself is very much a pilot. Um, and it's built to learn from, if that makes sense. Um, there's a lot of lessons to be gleaned about talent management, a lot of lessons to be gleaned about technology. And so it's not until this experiment's done are we gonna be able to, to maybe think, think about how to scale it more widely. I'd be interested to see what the cohort members think about the size of the cohort. Do you guys feel it's a pretty intimate experience? Are you getting enough attention? Head nods, okay. Thanks for the question. I think we have a couple more minutes if anybody wants to ask anything. There's a question somewhere over here. 
I veto over here. A, uh, the talent aspect of this is, is critical, and so uh, for probably for the cohort here and, and the future cohorts, they're assuming some individual risk with their career progression in all these different MOSs to build software. What's the on-ramp or off-ramp for them into a new MOS? And or what's the Army, what's the check the Army's gonna write to them for their ability to have a career in the Army after three years of building software away from their MOS? It's kind of a, it's yeah. a problem for my team and I know it's yeah. gonna no, emerge. Th thanks for the question, Corey. Uh, so um, what I could say, it's sort of like the, the last question, um, we're sort of well aware that everything that we do is gonna inform the creation or uh, the creation of, of new Army policy and practices about how we handle talent. Again, the Secretary said this morning we're in a race for talent. This is very much a part of the question that you just asked. Um, so the HQDA is uh, considering all options here. Um, I think that you know a lot of people recognize the Army doesn't want to make this type of investment and doesn't want to lose these kinds of soldiers. And so the thought is, how do we how do we best do that long term? To your point, and hopefully uh, we can help inform that process. I saw the companies listed on your one slide. How can other companies help? Is there still room? I thought you'd never ask. Um, so that is not an exhaustive, uh, exclusive list. That's just uh, an idea of some of the companies. Uh, so we try to have uh, industry interaction in a couple different ways. We talked a little bit about coming in person down to Austin and doing lunch and learns or demonstrations with the soldiers. Uh, what we didn't really talk about is built into the experience. Uh, COVID hasn't helped much, but but we're going to get there. About a 30 to 60 day uh, mini internship. We call them mini immersions. Uh, to, to vendors or to, or to industry that's interested in, in hosting a soldier for that amount of time. Um, and then, of course, uh, there's, there's plenty of opportunities across uh, the Army to connect to you um, for, for other things. So uh, there's a spot on our website. If you're an industry that, that wants to contribute to the collaboration going on at the software factory, you can do that. Or you come by the booth, and uh, we'll trade contact information there. And you can always visit the Army Software Factory website at uh, armyfuturescommand.com slash software dash factory. Yes, ma'am. I'll repeat it. Oh, thank you so much, ma'am. I just wondered if you look to the other services um, for lessons learned, especially the Air Force, and maybe the Level Up Code Works, which I think is in Austin near you. San Antonio. Um, yeah, oh, San Antonio. Um, just kind of for their experience and kind of how you're building your uh, practice. I Fantastic guess. question. Um, I'm sort of um, happy to report um, the process that informed everything that we just talked about uh, included about a 12 to 15 month, what, what I would kind of call a market analysis or industry analysis. And that, that included, to your point about the other services, what they're doing. The idea of incorporating service members into the application development process is not new, right? What's new about it is, is put it, building them into it long term and to invest in the people component, not just the technology component. What we saw as we looked at some of the other services was that they were doing really well for the initial service member involvement, but how to build it in longer term, that was something that had yet to be decided by any service. And so as we were conceptualizing it, we were thinking how long could we, could we you know, realistically keep a soldier and build it soldier first or service member first. And so the soldiers that come to the software factory as part of the experiment, the pilot that, that we've been talking about, they're there for three years. So whereas other services do the 179 day TDY, uh, we've got a whole uh, a whole unit full of people staying for three years. And that'll help lose a lot of, uh, you know, ameliorate a lot of the institutional turnover that goes on. G great question, ma'am. Uh, actually, and let me also add, that's the human component. The technology component, you know, the Air Force did a great job uh, codifying the uh, continuous RMF process, the risk mitigation framework process. Uh, and that's directly informed a lot of the DevSecOps um, environment that the Army CIO, the Enterprise Cloud Management Agency, and then us have, have all sort of co-developed. So again, cybersecurity comes down to precedent and reciprocity, and that, that was a big part of it. So we couldn't have done that without them. Vito, I'll be your last question if you want. So obviously the software fa factory's up and running, right? You've got great initial success. Are you um, efforting with project convergence uh, Ridgeway, AI2C, C5 ISR to kind of provide some connective tissue across this space? Yeah, so uh, there's a lot to say about the connective tissue and uh, what I would go back to is a lot of the policy that we're building um, 
uh, with HQDA regarding uh, cybersecurity processes. So the shared services, uh, we're in a, we're, we have a multi-cloud offering in both Azure and AWS. The shared services that create, um, which, is, which is championed by the Enterprise Cloud Management Agency underneath the Army CIO, all of that tech stack accreditation stuff is going to serve as the, the fabric across all of the efforts that we're starting to see. Um, because they're all built on the idea of the more rapidly you can get feedback onto an operational network, the more important it is for the Army. So I think we're pretty happy that we're anchoring that entire process and serving as a basis for the shared services there. And what we could also report, kind of like we talked about, everything that we do is has more than one partner. We've got multi-partners for every single aspect, whether it be platform, application, or in the human talent management fields. Um, so I would say uh, there's sort of no limit to the, to the um, collaboration that's going on. I thanks so much for doing this. Um, I guess I'm wondering, what's the duration of the experiment? What are the decision points along the way? Um, and, and when do you expect uh, HQDA to, to make decisions about whether to expand this or make it permanent? Thanks. Uh, so the experience from the soldier's perspective is three years. Uh, the first phase is about five to six months. The second phase is another six months. And then two years on top of that, helping to onboard and train uh, follow-on soldiers coming in in this emerging technology. Uh, so those are just, each one of those represents a decision point for me as a director. Is this soldier worth continuing to invest in? Are they a right fit? Because this is obviously not for everybody, not just from an emerging technology technical sense, but it's can you work as a team? Uh, do you understand what we're trying to do here? Um, you know, software is no longer sort of like a guy or a girl with a hooded sweatshirt and a, you, know, ear uh, you know, earphones in the back like we see on the movies. It's a team sport, and the Army's going to train it as a team sport and build it as a team sport, which is why we do those, those small product teams. Um, so if people can't uh, participate in that, then, you know, this is not the right spot for them. Um, and then with respect to HQDA, far be it from, from me to, to be able to put a timeline on HQDA, um, but I'm, I'm hopeful we'll hear something here in the next couple months. Oh, we got, I think, one more here. If we have time for one more. Hello, can you hear me? Loud and clear, ma'am. Yeah. Yes, I have a question. I saw uh, that you also mentioned there about design of programs to use in the field during soldiers' operations, correct? Can you say that one more time for me, ma'am? I am talking about software that is not for administrative tasks, but for operations in the field. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. My question is, I know that the expertise of a person to perform its duties is what really gives value to the use of a software. But, for example, if I ask you, I need to know, I need to know if we improve the efficiency, the reliability of a tank, for example, with a software about 15% or 25%, how you can help me to perform an evaluation so that we can know the financial and the uh, reliability results if we implement that change. Okay, that's all a study. You are performing a study with the help of your, of your people that do, uh, that develop programs. But I am a manager and I want to know, okay, I try do a test and I want to know how much if, for example, 15, 25%, I can improve the reliability of an equipment that is using a soldier that has expertise to use this, that equipment. And I want to know that because I want to know the financial impact, how much money I need to do that in all the army. And I want to have a document to ask the needed budget. Okay. Can you do that? <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think I understood some of the question, ma'am. I think the, the headline is uh, that we're certainly operating not just in an administrative sense, but also in a tactical sense. Um, 
and that uh, there's plenty of people around the Army, like uh, uh, Army Test Evaluation Command, that are working on problems that you just described. And if I didn't get it right, please come to the Software Factory booth right on the other side of this wall, and uh, we'll, we'll sit down and talk about it. I'm so sorry, ma'am. And I'm also getting the hook, uh, pending General Murray's guidance. No, and I, I usually don't make guest appearances at these, but for these guys, I will. So um, everything you just heard was an idea two years ago in two young majors, and we promoted one of them, uh, put this together in, in two years. And the, the talent we have in the Army is just absolutely incredible. I was told when we started this, you don't have that talent. you got to go buy it. you got to go hire it. you got to go find it. you got to go recruit it. We have the talent. Uh, these kids are just incredibly talented. And the question you ask is what people ask me all the time, what keeps me awake at night? That keeps me awake at night is we have the talent, we can develop the talent, and now we've got to figure out how to retain the talent because these kids will make a significant difference from both an administrative and on a future, future battlefield someplace. And then this has nothing to do with industry IP. This is all about solving problems that I have walked past for the last 40 years that our soldiers have each and every day that we can make a significant impact on our soldiers now into the future just by harnessing the talent we've got. So I, just a hats off to, this is one half of the Wonder Twins, so Vito and, and Jason Zuniga is the other half of the Wonder Twins, and, and really it's on their shoulders that, uh, that they've stood this up, and it's just an incredible experience. Come visit us at the Software Factory booth. We're out of time. Thank you again for paying attention. I really appreciate it. And, sir, thank you for that guest appearance. See you, everybody.